Hello, uh, this is Dr. Phil Rosenkrantz again. Uh, this is my third uh, installment on talking about investing. It's part of my IME for, uh, 4030 class where I surveyed my students about what investing topics they would be interested in hearing about. And the top ones were over here. I first uh, created the video on stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, kind of an underlying topic I thought I should go first. Then 401ks, IRAs, TSAs, and Roth IRAs were in number two. And this is the third one where I'm talking about real estate investing. Now, let me say that I am not a real estate uh, salesperson or broker. I'm not a licensed financial advisor. I'm not giving financial advice. I'm just uh, showing you uh, what these things are uh, from my background and some of the things I've done. And then if you want to pursue it further, you can. But sometimes you just need to kind of get a feel for what's going on. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, real estate investing is something that's worth considering uh, because there has been probably more wealth created through real estate investing than anything else in our country. And there's probably good reasons for that. Uh, this is my third recording of this video. Uh, the first one, the sound quality was bad. Uh, the second one, um, I realized after I was done uh, that uh, I needed to kind of talk about a few of the topics up front that affected all of the rest of the topics so that I didn't have to repeat myself or backtrack. So let me quickly talk about what I call some basics when it comes to real estate. Now, the first one I talk, want to talk about is the real estate market. And so what happens is over time, what we have in the real estate market is not just a steady increase in property values, but what we really have is more of cycles. And they look like this. You know, they can go up really high and then dip very low and then go up very high. And these could be anywhere from 10, uh, 10 to 15 year cycles. Um, I would say since I graduated from college and started um, uh, working and now 40, 50 years later, uh, I've seen three complete cycles. So here's my point. When real estate is going up in value and um, it can go up a couple of percent per month in, <laughs> in some cases, but as it's going up, uh, there's a tendency for people to say to themselves, well, the market is going up. I better buy now because it's just going to keep going up and I'll miss my chance. And the, the, that's fine, but keep in mind that when prices are going up and people are buying and driving the prices up, you're in a seller's market. The seller can charge more there's more competition to buy, and there are fewer good deals around. There are fewer um, properties that are sitting around um, that are undervalued. What I mean by that is, this is a time when if there's a house that is in bad shape, it's a fixer-upper, um, there are people that are paying cash for those and buying them because they're trying to flip them and take advantage of the market. And if you are wanting to buy one, unless you have some kind of a uh, inside, you may not be getting those best deals. So that's 
uh, an issue. And then the other thing that happens is, let's say that you buy when you're up here. And then all of a sudden the market goes down. And now you're stuck with a piece of property where it's not, it may not even be worth what you owe on it over here. And so this is a seller's market. Now when prices are dropping, then this is a buyer's market. And some stat strategies work fine um, because what you're going to do is buy when it's low and then hold on and eventually sell when it's high. And this is the time to buy property, right? If you know when it is. This concept affects how well a lot of these strategies work. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, I have bought properties in both of these cases. Um, I bought a piece of property once here and when I went to sell it five years later, it was down here. Actually, I went to sell it three years later and I had to wait for the market to come back. I had to wait two and a half years before I could finally sell it. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is I bought two properties down here in 2008 and 2009 and now they're up here. So anyway, that's the market issue. So that is something that you need to be sensitive to. Next, I want to talk about leverage. This is one of the big reasons why real estate is such a good investment. What is leverage? Basically, it's this. Let's say that you buy a $500,000 home. You put $100,000 as a down payment. This is your money. Um, that you put down and then <clears throat> then you finance through a loan a mortgage the other 400000 and you're making payments on this loan every month most of that is probably interest but you're making these payments so now let's say a couple of years later Let's say this property has appreciated up to 550000 That's what it's worth now. And you sell the property for 550000 In the meantime, maybe you've put uh, through your loan payments, you've gotten a little more equity in the property, but uh, let's ignore that for a minute because it's not very much. So you sell the property for 550,000, you paid uh, 500,000 for it. You get the, your 100,000 back and you pay off the mortgage to the bank. So you've just made a $50,000 profit on a $100,000 investment. That is a 50% return over a couple of years, isn't it? That is a very nice return. That's a lot more than you would get in the bank or the stock market, right? And this is because of leverage. The leverage is this. The reason you got 50% was because you didn't have to pay the entire 500000 you used borrowed money, other people's money. We call that OPM in graduate school. OPM, other people's money. That way, instead of you only getting a, let's say, if instead of 50K profit on 100,000, let's say you made the whole $500,000 down yourself, that's a 10% return, isn't it? But you only put in 100. So 
This is called leverage, using other people's money. Now that works when you have appreciation. In other words, when the market is going in the right direction. However, if you do this when the market's going in the other direction, you lose your shirt. And I know people that's happened to. So, well, probably we all do. So that's leverage. Leverage is a big deal. If you use it right. Um, the third one is tax issue. So there's a, some tax advantages uh, to um, rental property, for example. So let's say um, that you buy a property and uh, so you've made a down payment. I'm making the cash flow diagram here. You made a down payment of whatever it was. We'll call it a down payment. And then you still have to make your loan payments, your mortgage payments. So these are your loan payments. But then you're getting income from the rent. You have some other expenses along the way, maintenance, um, things like that, maybe repairs. Um, but hopefully that your rent minus your loan payments, you're able to make a little money every month. Now, as rents go up over time because of inflation, then you have a chance of increasing your monthly uh, profit from it. But there's another advantage to real estate. These are just your monthly expenses but you also have the expense of depreciation on the property. You are entitled to spread the cost of the building part of your property over a number of years, say 30 years as depreciation. It's an expense of yours. And what that does is it adds on paper, it adds a cost. This is the depreciation. Well, I'm going to make it constant. So, this is depreciation. Now your cash flow is based on rent minus loan. But on paper, for tax purposes, you can include depreciation so that you end up with a loss. And your loss becomes a deduction. And then this shelters some of your regular income from taxes. So let's say you're in an incremental bracket of 20%. So let's say that you have a loss of, say, $5,000 on your rentals for the year. That's going to save you 20% of that. That's going to save you $1,000 in taxes. It's going to shield that from the rest of your income. And so real estate has some nice uh, tax consequences. Now keep in mind that when you sell the property down the road you're going to have to pay capital gains tax but that's that's down the road. So depreciation uh, you, you get to charge off all the property taxes you pay as expenses, uh, the insurance you're paying. It's a business. You've got a rental business. And so from a tax standpoint, real estate is very favorable. So those three things I wanted to cover because they kind of come into play uh, all throughout the rest of these but I don't need to talk about them anymore too much. 
So now let's talk about these different ways that people can make money. I put flipping houses first because it's all over the uh, reality TV now. There's flip and flop and all kinds of different flip uh, programs. And the way it works simply is that let's say there's a $300,000 piece of uh, real estate, uh, a home that could sell if it's in good shape. This would be the market value of a good home. But because it's run down, let's say that uh, it, you know, it's got a bad roof. It's got all kinds of other issues to it. Um, maybe on the market, uh, it's worth 200,000. I'm making these numbers up. Uh, so this is uh, what it's the, uh, uh, selling for. This is what it's worth. So you buy it for 200,000 and you put uh, $50,000 into it to fix it up. And so you've got $250,000 in it. You sell it for the market value. And so you make a $50,000 profit. And the reason this works is because you're making sure that you're buying a property at a price that makes sense for you so that even after you fix it up, you still can make some money. Um, so this works, but keep in mind, first of all, finding these properties is important. If you don't find the right property, this doesn't work. So you need to have access to that information. Um, from what I can tell, the best deals never make it to the market because they're bought up by the real estate agents and their friends um, that they work with. And so it's word of mouth a lot of times. The other thing is you need to be able to do these renovations economically. Either you're doing it yourself or you're doing some of it yourself and using subcontractors or you have subcontractors or a contractor doing it for you, but they have to be doing a good job in a timely fashion, doing uh, what you need done. And so all of these things have to work and you have to have kind of a seller's market and uh, in a sense, but um, anyway, do this. Uh, the other thing that you can do is uh, and then what, what these flip shows are showing is that people flip it. They sell it as soon as it's finished. And so they're trying to do this uh, multiple times a year or simultaneously with various projects. It's all doable, but you have to learn how it works. Um, now, keep in mind what I said about business cycles, the market. Uh, one of my college buddies, he and his wife, or house flippers and I was I visited with him a few years ago and he said one year they did seven flips because the market allowed it the next year they only did one flip because of the market so keep in mind it's not um, it's not like falling off a log or anything but it, it can be done now that brings me to the these next two, buy and sell, buy and rent. Well, the idea here is you're, you're trying to buy a piece of property, say it's a $500,000 market value. You don't want to pay more than what it's worth, but you're trying to find a good deal, maybe a slight fixer-upper, something that needs a little TLC. Um, but anyway, you're getting yourself into a property and then um, in this buy and sell case, you're, you're not selling it right away. You're not flipping it. And maybe you'll keep it for a couple of years. Um, it'll appreciate in value. Um, you've rented it out. The renters are paying the uh, uh, mortgage for you. And then, and you're getting your tax benefits. 
and then at the end of a couple of years you're selling it and you're getting your profit from it whatever it is you know say you sell it for 550 like in my previous example and then you uh, have your profit and then you do whatever you're going to do with it maybe reinvest it or something else but uh, that's just the classic buying and selling um, looking for a fair fair deal but you um, can make a lot of money on it uh, if the market's going up if the market's going down this doesn't work does it but this is probably one of the most common things people do the second thing people do is buy and rent long term let's say So it's the same scenario. They buy a piece of property, but they rent it out long term. In other words, 20, 30 years, whatever, forever. Um, and this is very attractive from the standpoint that if we're looking at a long period of time, let's say this is 20 years, um, rents go up over time with the economy with inflation and you can keep raising your rent now you don't necessarily do it every year but you know it might look like this it might step up but you're raising rent based on the market and if your payments on your loan say you got a 20-year loan are constant then and if you're maintaining the property then over time you're getting more and more rental income but then also keep this in mind after you pay off the property then most of the rent goes into your pocket and if you're running a house out for two thousand dollars a month now in 20 or 30 years that's going to be a lot uh, more than that and that could be all income and if you've got two or three houses that you've paid off over time then that's a retirement income right there that's pretty cool so buying and running long term and I knew people that did that uh, when I worked for General Motors they would buy a couple of houses over time or they bought a, uh, a couple of duplexes or a fourplex or a small apartment building they took care of it they nurtured it for 20 or 30 years and boom they had a full retirement right there and um, from rentals I have a friend who uh, I ran into a couple of years ago and I said hey what are you doing now and he said oh he says real estate and I said well what are you doing and he said I'm going to the mailbox I said, what do you mean? He says, I go to the mailbox and pick up my checks. And I said, okay, you've got to explain that. So what he had done is he had acquired 10 rentals, uh, two in California, and the rest were all out of state. Um, but his strategy was to buy rental homes in places where prices were good, the supply of renters was good and the economy was stable usually around a military base or a university or some place where economy was growing and then he would have the local real estate there are real estate offices that manage property for you they take a percentage but they collect the rent they find the renters they maintain the property uh, they take out the expenses and then they send you a check every month for the profit and uh, he a couple of his houses he owned outright completely and then he was slowly paying off the others and using also some of his income to buy more rent rentals but his goal was to eventually have 30 rentals his goal was to go to the mailbox every day and pick up a check and so he was basically doing that now Let me move on though. Uh, REIT. 
R-E-I-T. That stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. Now, you may want, not want, to get your hands dirty with buying and selling houses, fixing them up, renting them out, being a landlord. Um, I was a landlord uh, for a while, and I had good experiences and I had bad experiences. Um, I would say uh, you hear horror stories, and some of them are really true, but if you have a good attitude and you do it right, um, yeah, you're still going to get screwed a couple times, but in the long run, you can come out okay. Now, if you want to avoid all that, consider real estate investment trust. And you may be able to invest in these using your 401k money. Do it inside your 401k. What is a real estate investment trust? This is a company who buys property, fixes it up, rents it out, and they use investor money to buy the property, like apartment buildings or, or houses. And then uh, the profit then goes back to the investors. And I'm looking at one right now I'm considering getting into. And they're guaranteeing almost an eight and a quarter uh, percent. Can't even write. Eight and a quarter percent interest. every year and then um, you can put your money in now and you can take it out whenever you want you're just buying a share of this trust and it's pretty secure it's very low risk and so um, I don't if you invest in that then the only thing you have to do is when you pull your money out or when you get your annual dividend on it you have to pay taxes on it because it's ordinary income but if it's inside your real estate, I mean, it's inside your uh, 401k, then it's not taxable. But that's an REIT, a REIT. A commercial property, I'm not going to say too much about it. I don't know too much about it. But some people invest in commercial property. Uh, uh, retail stores, outlets, small buildings, um, etc. And it's just a different market. Uh, but some people like that. Um, I put the word retirement here because I wanted to kind of point out another option. I did talk about retirement when I talked about buy and rent long term. But let me show you another strategy I heard about. And you can kind of make variations of this, but it makes a point about the, an advantage of real estate. So... This was called the five house retirement plan. And people were doing this or variations of it. Here's the concept. Um, let me erase this. <clears throat> In year one, you buy a house. And um, so let's say you pay... Uh, you buy a $500,000 home, you put a down payment, whatever it is. Let me make that a $300,000 home. So you have a three hundred dollars home. Um, you bought it for, for tw you know, 20% down. Maybe not so much. But you bought a home. The next year you've saved up and you bought a second home. So you've got a, a second rental. Then a third. Then a fourth. And then in year five, you buy the fifth rental. Now, let me talk about how could you afford that. Well, let's say that you have a two-income family. Um, live off of one income and save the second income and buy houses. And I've known people that have done that. It's where you have two engineers that are married, or in one case, it was two pharmacists. And they were just buying houses like crazy. And so here's what how this works. So this is year one, two, three, four, and five. 
Now, where does the retirement plan come into? With this method here, I told you, the buy and rent, I, told, I was showing you a 20-year plan to retire, didn't I? Sort of. But this one's a five-year plan. How does that work? So here you are at the end of year five. So what you do is you go back to the first house, and by now, let's say after five years, uh, it's worth 350 k So what you do is you refinance this house, and um, you refinance the house, and before, let's say that uh, whatever it was, you know, you've been making payments for five years, so it's got some equity in it. You refinance the house, and you pull $50,000 cash out of it. You refinance the rest, and your renters are still making payments that will cover that. But now you've got this $50,000 cash, and this is your retirement income for the year, for the year six. This 50000 It's equity that you pulled out of here. And then the next year, you do the same thing. With the second house you bought. You pull fifty k out of it. And this is your retirement money for the second year. And you refinance this house. And then you keep doing that every year. And that's what you live on. That's your retirement plan. And then at the end of five years, the next five years, in year 11, you go back and refinance this house again. Now, chances are you wouldn't do it exactly like that. There would be some market issues, timing issues. But in general, the point is that if you had these five houses, um, you could just keep pulling equity out as long as there was some steady rate of inflation over time. So here's one of the biggest advantages of doing this. And that is this $50,000 is borrowed money. You borrowed it out of the equity of your home. Borrowed money is not taxable income. You don't have to pay any taxes on that 50000 The only time you'd have to pay taxes is when you sell the house, if you ever do. The profit you make on the house is capital gains. And you have to pay taxes on that. But as long as you just keep borrowing, then you're okay. Now, unfortunately, I've known people who have tried to do this but they did it when the market was high. And when the market dropped, they were upside down on all these houses because they were buying them all at the same time. And they tanked and lost it all. So that, that's that market timing I was talking about up here. But if you do handle that right, then you can keep pulling out equity as long as you have plenty of equity left to cover any drops. So that's what this plan is about. Um, being able to, to borrow on your equity. Um, the last thing I want to point out is seconds. This is another idea for people that don't want to get their hands dirty. Uh, sometimes uh, when somebody's going to buy a piece of property, let's use my 500k example again, and the banks like to have 20% down payment. Why do they want 20%? That's so that if they ever uh, have to foreclose on the property, there's hopefully still a lot of mark, uh, equity in the uh, property, a lot of um, a buffer between what they owe and what it's worth on the market. So. 20%. Um, but let's say you don't have 20%. Well, what you might do is you might have 10%, but you can borrow another 10% 
from as a second mortgage from somebody else, like a private party um, or somebody like that. Uh, not, not usually from a bank, but a second mortgage. And then now you have the 20% down payment. So you're making your payments on your loan for the property, the 80% you borrowed. And then you're making a loan of a payment on the second mortgage. Now this is usually maybe um, five or 10 years to pay that off. It's a, it's a higher interest rate than on the first mortgage because there's more risk. It's a higher interest rate. And I did that once where I borrowed uh, about 10% uh, on a second mortgage for a rental. And I never intended to keep it more than a couple of years. I was going to keep it two to three years and sell it. So I got a five-year second interest only where I was just paying interest only on this 10% with the idea that at the end of five years I would have a balloon payment and pay off the entire loan. That's because I never intended to keep the property more than five years. But guess what? I had bought at, at the top of the market, not really at the top, but the market had dropped and my problem was, I had the, I put the property up for sale at three years, and it wouldn't sell. It took me two and a half years to sell the property. I made a, I made a profit, but the five years came, and I had to pay off the balloon payment. So I had to get that money from somewhere else, which I did, but it wasn't a good use of my money. Um, it wasn't pretty. But if you have money that you can loan out as a second mortgage, then you can make money on that. And if the people default on paying you, you might have the right to foreclose on their property <laughs> and take it over. But let me tell you another advantage of a second mortgage. Because this happened to a friend of mine. He and his wife bought 20 acres of property in Rancho Cucamonga, California, many years ago. Their idea was that they could eventually sell it to a developer who wanted to build homes. So they, they kept the property for a while. They sold it for a nice profit. <clears throat> but they carried a second mortgage on it. The person that had the, that bought the property from them got sick uh, and um, eventually died of cancer. But in the meantime, he quit making his bank payments on the property and it went into foreclosure. And no, he didn't have any relatives or anybody that were gonna rescue him from this so that they wouldn't lose their property and it went into foreclosure and so my friend had second position on the property and had the option of taking it over catching up with the bank you know make the back payments and taking it over and now he owned he did that and now he owned the property again he had already sold it once and made a profit when he sold it the second time, he made $4 million profit. So, that's, that's because he had the second mortgage. He was able to do that. Now, that is very rare. A lot of times, people aren't going to let their relatives <laughs> lose millions of dollars. They're going to come out, you know, find some way to sell it or do something. But they didn't even sell the property. So, he took it over. So... That's second mortgages. Now, <clears throat> there are other ways to make money, um, but keep in mind these, these three things I taught you as you're working on some of this stuff. Um, so with that, I'm going to try and end, but I'm going to end with a shameless plug, and that is, um, I want to mention 
uh, my book that I wrote and published a few months ago, and Letters from Uncle Dave, um, The 73-Year Journey to Find a Missing in Action World War II Paratrooper. Um, this is the story of my uncle, Staff Sergeant David Rosencrantz, who was missing in action in World War II. Family never knew what happened to him. I saw the movie Saving Private Ryan in 1998 and said, gee, I wonder what I could find out about my uncle. What happened to him? So this is about a 20-year quest to find out what happened to him. Eventually, uh, he, his remains were found. I did find out what happened to him. And it's in this book. And um, it's an interesting story. It's got 49 letters in it that he wrote home that I was able to collect. And uh, it makes a great gift for your friends and relatives and kids that are interested in this stuff or need to learn about World War II. Uh, it's available from Amazon, but if you go to philrosencrantz.com, all one word, then that's the website for this book. So anyway, that's my shameless plug. Thank you for listening. And I hope this made sense, and uh, good luck with everything. Thank you.